All right, you guys, as you can see by the thumbnail, I'm back with another one like the other one. And I'm going to get straight to it. I'm not going to waste no time. I'm not going to do no lollygagging, no pussyfooting, no shilly shallying, none of that stuff. I'm going to get straight to it. Shilly shallying. <laughs> you guys like that? I wonder how many of you guys are actually going to Google that or go look that up in the dictionary. Well, nobody grabs a dictionary no more. Everybody Google shit now. Who's going to go and grab a book or, or, or a dictionary? Anyways, I'm going to get straight into it. But before I do, let me just say this real quick. For those of you that have been asking about inner demons, I will put an episode out tomorrow. Don't quote me on that. But the next, the next video I drop will be on inner demons. Or I'll drop two videos. I'll make sure I get that one in. I know some of you have been asking for the next episode. I'll get around to it. I, I promise you that. So just trust me. I'm on it. So like I said, this right here is going to be a continuation or a follow-up on that death row story regarding the fatal mono stabbing and the hypocrisy of death row politics. But first, before I get into this part of the story, let me bring something to your guys' attention that definitely affected the first part of this story. In part one of this story, there were some serious editing issues that I know for a fact impacted you guys from understanding some of the things that I was trying, some of the points that I was trying to make. So like, I don't always watch the videos after they're edited. I trust that the video's edited the way that it's supposed to be. And that's probably my fault for not doing that. But the first thing that I noticed when I did, when I did watch it, and you know, I kind of picked up on this from somebody else that watched the video, is that a lot of the pictures that were supposed to be displayed when I went over the yard schematics how the yards were set up, meaning who's out there, how they're broken up, et cetera, et cetera. Those pictures weren't displayed. So I'm going to I'm gonna run that part of the story again, just that part of the story so that you guys can understand how the yards are broken up, who's where, who's on what yard, and all that good stuff. And like I told you guys in the first part, there's six death row yards behind East Block. So in the mid-90s, yard one through four were all death row yards. Yard five was assigned to Southern Mexican white ADSEG inmates. Yard six was assigned to Northern Mexican black ADSEG inmates. But at some point thereafter, they stopped putting ADSEG inmates on yards five and six and assigned all six of these yards to death row. So on death, on death row, on, on, the, on the first yard out there, on one yard, you had a few crips and a mixture of other death row inmates. But it was an active yard. And this I'm talking about in the mid 90s when when yard six was still back there, when the ad sick inmates used to go to yard back there. So this is how it was set up back then before they changed it. This is the way that I remember it. So then on yard two, you had Crips and Bloods. And this was also an active yard. The Crips were split due to some issues that involved Tookie and Fee. So that's why some were on yard one and some were on yard two. On yard three, you had a mixture of Bay Area Blacks, and then you had some other stragglers. Then on yard four, you had your undesirables, your Richard Allen Davises, your, your Richard Ramirez's, your Ramon Salcido's, those kind of cats, Dennis Singh and all those kind of cats. So and then on yard five, you had some active Southern Mexicans and whites. This was back then. Then on yard six, you had some dropout Sureños, that debriefed and then you had some other dropout sureños that didn't debrief because it was no longer a requirement and then you had a lot of keepaways that were out there on yard six this is how it was back then and again yard four was considered to be death row pc so here's the point that i was trying to make in the first part of this story when todd asker and danny troxel prevailed on that class action suit that got all the validated gang members released from the shoe this also impacted death row as well. As I explained in the first part of the story, death row had its own shoe, which was basically the adjustment center. You had a lot of death row inmates that had been stranded in the AC for 10, 15, even 20 years because they were validated death row inmates. They weren't allowed to go to East Block. That was the way that it was before the Todd Asker and Danny Troxel ruling. When that ruling came down and they let everybody out of the shoe in, in Pelican Bay, that also impacted the guys that were validated on death row, the ones that had been stuck in the adjustment center for all those years. And now they were allowing them to go to East Block, which is death row's mainline. 
But guys like Hector and Ronnie Ayala that are validated Mexican Mafia members, they were stuck in the Adjustment Center for years. But again, when Asker and Troxel prevailed on that class action suit, it significantly changed death row as well. Ronnie, in fact, was the first one to be moved to East Block after their mainline status was restored. The other thing that you guys need to understand is that some of the assignments for death row inmates also changed as a result of that ruling as well. You know, I mentioned this in the first part of my story, but we all know, and it's a, it's a well-known fact, that a lot of the death row cases, a lot of the guys that are on death row, they have some, some ugly cases. There's some heinous cases with some just some, some, some ugly details. Everybody knows that. Cases that would normally shock the conscience of the average person if they were to read about some of the intricate details. That's just the reality of it. These cases include rape, pedophilia, as well as the harming and killing of innocent children. These were the class of death row inmates that they used to segregate. But this also seemed to change, as you'll see for yourself. Don't get it misconstrued, though. Not all death row inmates are on death row for those type of weird old crimes. There's a lot of gang members on death row for killing other gang members. When I was housed over there on death row, I met a lot of these guys myself. A lot of the gang members that were there on death row for killing other gang members. I met a lot of them there. I was on the tier with a lot of those guys and I walked the yard with some of them. But these were gang members, validated gang members that were there for killing other gang members. And although taking someone else's life is not acceptable on any level, the fact still remains that they're not baby killers pedophiles or rapists. Now, one of the points that I was really trying to explain and was hoping would resonate with you guys was that for any death row inmate, being housed in East Block comes with a lot of privileges, incentives, and perks. Compared to the AC, being housed in East Block is like night and day. This is considered to be death row's main line, East Block. They're afforded contact visits, group yard. They're given access to using the phone. They're allowed to have a lot more property in their cells, such as hobby craft, typewriters, fans, musical instruments, jewelry, TVs, radios, Walkmans, all that good stuff. No, seriously, they do. They let them, they let them have a lot of property over there. Those are the official perks. But due to contact visits and a lot more access and resources, the unofficial perks are having access to drugs and cell phones from being in East Block, being housed over there in East Block. They literally, they got everything over there. Heroin, meth, weed, fentanyl, et cetera, et cetera. It's all over there. There's also the ability to buy cell phones, which are priceless for networking and conducting gang business. You got to have cell phones. Being over there in East Block and having a cell phone and being an active gang member it gives you a lot more advantage than being in the adjustment center and not having a cell phone. You're over there in the adjustment center. You don't have a cell phone. You're, you know, you're basically left to deal with the resources that you got. Coded letters, got to wait for visits. You don't have no access at using the phone over there. So imagine going from that to having a, a cell phone in the palm of your hand and being able to call people without being recorded, being able to, to call people that you wouldn't be able to call if, you know, the, 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 the phone was recorded. So it gives you a lot of latitude. There's a lot more incentives and privileges that come along with being over there in East Block. But the bottom line is that losing these privileges and going back to the AC doesn't justify not making the type of sacrifices that come along with membership to a criminal organization. Bottom line is you still have your responsibilities. You still have your obligations. And I'm not promoting criminal activity. I'm simply making a point. I'm showing you guys the hypocrisy with the politic. Or let me say it another way. For criminal organizations like the NF, MAAB, BGF, there's a certain level of obligation that comes with being a member. You've committed yourself to the politics that come along with the territory meaning that these organizations don't program with certain individuals who are frowned upon. Unless the rules have changed, this includes not programming with rapists, not programming with those that have harmed, molested, or killed children, et cetera, et cetera. This also applies to death row as well. There is no exception, nor is there anything that makes a death row inmate exempt from these obligations.
period. You're still bound to the politics. I understand someone not wanting to lose privileges or access to drugs, cell phones, especially after being stuck in the AC for years. But unless the rules have changed, here's where the hypocrisy and death row politics comes into play. So the following is a breakdown on the death row yard assignments and how these yards are classified. Keep in mind that some of the Crips yards are broken up by set, by their neighborhood. So yard one is considered to be an active yard. There's active Mexican mafia members over there. You got Crips, Bloods, Whites, and then you got some stragglers out there. Yard two is considered to be an active yard as well. There's active Sorenos, Cribs, Bloods, some Whites. You got some other stragglers out there. And here's just a few individuals that are assigned to yard two. Yard three is considered to be an active yard. There's active NF members, Bloods, Paisas, some Northanials out there. I believe there's five Northanials. And then you got some stragglers out there. So yard four is still considered a non-active yard. You got your rapists, your baby killers, and your pedophiles over there. There is no active gang members on yard four. Yard five is considered to be an active yard as well. There's active Compton Crips out there. You got Long Beach Crips, Bloods, Whites, and then you also got some stragglers out there. Yard six are dropouts, Sorenos, and Bulldogs. Now, like I said earlier, some of these guys have debriefed and then there's others who just walked away since debriefing is no longer a requirement. So now that I broke down all the schematics of the yard arrangements or the yard assignments, let me go back over the other issue that was lost in translation or for the same reasons that was lost because the pictures weren't depicted. So like I, like I told you guys, there, there's a few Sorenos on death row that are not happy because of the way that death row politics are being pushed out there the way that things are being handled. But they're scared to speak up as they fear that if they do, that this will end up putting them in the crosshairs or that they'll be subjected to the mono treatment. The one thing I'm gonna say about my source is, my source is somebody that is firmly against the hypocrisy that's being promoted on death row as far as the politics. One example that he gave was of Antonio Tony Boy Rodriguez from San Fernando Valley. He said, how can you justify killing somebody like Mono or go after Soldier Boy or other Sureños for things like money, dope, insubordination, or any politics when people are walking the yards with these other guys? As far as Tony Boy, he said, this is somebody that's on walk alone behind the circumstances of his case. So basically what he was, what he was saying is that even though Tony Boy is on walk alone, 
He's in he's in a walk alone cage, and while everybody else is doing their routine, they're doing their workout, their burpees, their calisthenics. Tony Boy is in a walk alone cage, and he's doing those exercises with everybody else, with the collective. That gives off the appearance as if he's still part of the team, that he's still embraced on some level. Understandably, nobody can do anything to stop him. If he's in a walk alone cage and he's working out and he's doing that, you know, in sync with with the rest of the, you know, the rest of the machina or the rest of the machine or the collective, whatever you want to call it. Nobody can do nothing about that. You can't stop them. But I think there's a general consensus or bad sentiment over the fact that he's still being acknowledged and greeted in passing. You know, when, when cats walk by him, when he's coming back from medical or something, or when he's coming back from a visit, I guess apparently what's happening is other active cats that see him, they're acknowledging him or they're talking to him. Hey, what's up, homie? How you doing, bro? Or, hey, when was he us? You know, things like that. You're acknowledging somebody. You're giving them that respect, that common courtesy, that respect. That's not something that you do with somebody that has those kind of charges. And again, this is not coming from me. I'm a conduit. I'm speaking on behalf of the sources that put out this story, the sources that want these things to be said. So with regard to my sources, and there is a couple, let me just say this. My sources are no longer active. And they have all walked away from this lifestyle after spending years in the AC. You know, these guys, they were they were in the thick of it in the 90s. Back in the 90s, they were in the thick of it. They were, you know, cats that were involved in, in the racial riots. They were involved in the wars against the COs. And, you know, at least one or two of them were somebody that was real close to Ronnie and Burr. It's also someone who used to assist them both with drafting up 602s. And according to my, my source, this was something that Ronnie did compulsively, writing 602s. So let's get back to the issue regarding Freddie Fuviava, Smokey from Linwood, and how his personal issue between him and Ronnie escalated. This is the Samoan Mexican Mafia member that Ronnie politics against over personal issues. I told you guys I would go into the reasons and the personal nature of the disagreement Ronnie had with Smokey. So that's what I'm gonna do. As I said, Mono's killing stemmed from his own indiscretion for failing to honor Ronnie's directive about not acknowledging Smokey. Ronnie basically told all the Sureños not to, not to acknowledge Smokey, not to fish with them, not to acknowledge him on any level, basically to shut him down, excommunicate him, and he didn't want nobody talking to him. So keep in mind, this all started in the Adjustment Center. Ronnie started sending directives to the other Sureños while they were still in the adjustment center prior to them moving to East Block. This was when they were all still on walk alone in cages. And just when they started to hear about the possibility of all of them moving to East Block, they had just started to hear rumors about the possibility that this ruling had come down, the, the Todd Asker and, and the Danny Troxel ruling had come down and that that it was going to affect them too, that they were going to actually be moved to East Block and we're going to get their mainline status back. This wasn't just going to only affect, you know, the Mexican mafia members and everybody else out there on the main lines, on all the level four prisons, all the prisons everywhere else. It was also going to affect death row as well. So they started to hear these rumors. They started to hear these rumors that, hey, we're finally going to, you know, they're finally going to open up the gates. They're, they're going to free us. They're going to break the chains after all these years. They're going to let us go, go over to East Block and, and do our thing over there. And that's that's huge. I'm sure it was huge to a lot of them. These guys had been stranded over there for years. You know, I spent a lot of time with a lot of these guys over there in the Adjustment Center. So I can just imagine putting myself back over there. I can imagine the you know, the excitement that, that these guys probably felt when they actually came in there and told them, hey, you guys are probably going to be all going to East Block. You guys are all going to end up getting released from the Adjustment Center, and you guys are going to finally be able to go to East Block and program with everybody else. I can just imagine. I know how it was over there in the Adjustment Center. Everybody, you know, it's that, that building, it's a, you know, there's three tiers over there. It used to be a cool spot to go to. 
especially for for ad sec inmates. It was a cool spot. We go over there. We'd have radios. We'd have everything. Sweats. Death row inmates would hook us up. Walkman, headphones, the whole hookup. But towards, I want to say towards the later part of the '90s, they came in there and they redid the whole adjustment center. They they came in there and they took all the gates down in the front of the cells and put up, you know, solid doors and solid walls. So yeah, like you were you were in a dungeon back there now. It used to be open where you could talk to other people on the tier. They could hear you. But when they put up the solid doors, the solid walls, it was like they entombed you and you couldn't hear nothing no more. So the, the adjustment center, it wasn't the spot to be no more. You couldn't fish over there. You couldn't pass nothing. So it was fucked up. And a lot of that was because of a lot of the staff that were getting speared, sliced up over there from death row inmates. When death row inmates started to assault staff, that's when they took a lot more security precautions over there. They started wearing helmets, shields. They they flipped the whole script. They started doing everything different. You know, I'll get into everything and all the details about what started this, this personal disagreement in a minute. But this all started in the adjustment center. So, I mean, again, this was supposed to be a momentous occasion when these guys heard that they were getting moved. For all these guys, they found out they were getting out of the hole after all these years. So I'm sure a lot of them were happy. The majority of the Sureños in the Adjustment Center were confused by Ronnie's position and why he was taking such a hard stance against Smokey. But, you know, they were in no position to question it. When Ronnie started putting out all these filters, talking about, you know, shut Smokey down, don't communicate with them, don't fish with them, shine them on. He's not to get, you know, he has nothing coming. A lot of the Sureños were confused because Smokey hadn't done nothing as far as they were concerned in their eyes. This was all politics. You know, this was somebody that they looked up to. This was one of their big homies. Smokey, you know, indoctrinated a lot of these, these Sureños that were on death row. A lot of them, they admired him. They looked up to him. He was a big homie. So even Hector, which is somebody that I've personally interacted with. Hector, Hector's a cool cat. I got a lot of respect for Hector. I was on the tier with him for you know, a good eight solid months. Hector was making pulque. He was making some good ass wine. I give him his props for that. But, you know, on a on a personal level, I got a lot of respect for Hector. He's a good dude. But even Hector, who is the more liberal and diplomatic, you know, of him and Ronnie, he pleaded with Ronnie to let it go and to start, you know, to stop digging his heels in when it came to Smokey. He was like, you know, he's like, come on, brother. He's like, we're all going to East Block. We're all going to be united. We're going to be one. He's like, let it go. You know, let it go. He's a he's a good man. You know what I mean? Let it go. But Ronnie, Ronnie wouldn't change his mind. Ronnie was dead set on, you know, taking Smokey's license, pulling his membership. But a lot of these, a lot of the Sureños that were confused, a lot of the other Sureños on death row that were confused, you know, they, they would come out to the yard and they would get it Hector. They're like, hey. Hey, Hector, you know, can you explain, you know, with all due respect, without getting too much into your guys' personal business, you know, can you explain why we're being told to cut Smokey loose? And Hector would tell them, hey, nobody disrespects Smokey. He's not one no more, meaning that he's not a, a member of the Mexican Mafia no more. But Smokey's still a good man, and he's still to be shown a level of respect. You know, again, Hector tried emphatically telling Ronnie, like, man, come on, man, you know, let it go, man, you know, let it go, uh, uh, Ronnie, you know, a lot of a lot of the youngsters, they look up to Smokey, you know, but in the end, Hector had to go along with his brother. When he seen that Hector, that, that Ronnie wasn't going to budge, you know, at some point he was like, you know, there's nothing, there's nothing else I can do. So he had to go along with his brother's decision. But, you know, again, what didn't sit right with a lot of the other Sureños is that this was an internal issue. You know, Smokey shouldn't have been deemed no good or shouldn't have been cut off the way that he the way he was, you know, taking him off the guile. Because that's one of the first things that they did is they took him off the guile. The, you know, when you wake up in the morning, hey, buenos dias, buenos, buenos noches, you know, when. When you hear the guy on the tears. And you hear somebody go down the line and they acknowledge everybody that is part of the household, everybody that's active. They do the same thing at night when there's no chance and they'll go down the tier. When 
you've been doing that for a long time and all of a sudden now somebody skipped the writings on the wall when you hear that you know oh shit something's happening you know this individual they they cut him loose or something something's going on because i didn't hear him call him later on that night damn they didn't call him again so something is definitely going on with, with smoky and not only do the inmates hear about this so even the ceos they probably even heard it and were like damn they didn't say nothing to fubiava so they even knew that something was going on with smoky when you don't hear him being acknowledged anymore and you know i'm sure when they pull him out of the cell and they take him on a escort somewhere they're mindful of, of what's going on while he's being escorted they're paying attention to who's acknowledging him and who's not acknowledging him so you know, it, it didn't take a lot of time for them to pick up on it that, you know, Smokey was being excommunicated for some reason. And a lot of these Sureños that were on the tier with them, you know, they were being told not to acknowledge him and not to not to speak to him. But a lot of them felt like this was secondhand dry snitching that, you know, to do that openly on the tier, it's basically advertising that he's got an issue. Or he's he's in trouble. So like my source said, Smokey wasn't a piece of shit. He didn't do nothing like, you know, he didn't catch a foul case. You know, he didn't commit some type of a vile act. You know, this was all predicated on a personal disagreement. And they feel like it should have been handled accordingly. So now fast forward to the incident that took place with Mono. At one point, Ronnie ends up getting rolled up from East Block and he goes back to the adjustment center. According to my source, this is when word was sent back to East Block to put the wheels in motion to go ahead and get rid of Mono. And that's what happened. According to my source, Ronnie never thought that they would ever go to East Block. He never thought that they would ever get released from the AC and get sent or get moved to East Block. He never thought that any ruling would ever come into play. He never even thought that the Mexican Mafia members that were in Pelican Bay, he didn't think that they were ever going to hit the main lines. He was like, you're crazy. They're never going to let them out there on the main lines. I thought the same thing myself. I thought there would be a bloodbath out there. Considering all the blood that had been spilled over the years, I didn't think they'd ever let everybody that was validated in the shoe programs, Corcoran, Pelican Bay, Tehachapi. I, didn't never, I never thought they would let them back out to the main lines, but they did. So Ronnie thought that they were stranded back there for the duration and that they'd never see the light of day again, that they'd never get moved to East Block. So he thinks that they're stranded. He thinks that everybody up in Pelican Bay is stranded. None of them are ever going to hit the main line. This is just, it's, it's wishful thinking, but it's not going to happen. But next thing you know, all these Mexican mafia members, they start popping up in Folsom, High Desert, Corcoran. Ronnie started to panic. According to my source, he started to panic. Then when they finally got word that they were all getting out, my source said that Ronnie started to act worried. He started to act worried because he felt like everything that had happened in the adjustment center was going to come back to bite him. That's basically what, what he said. And he said it was evident by the fact that Ronnie kept telling everybody that, you know, he's like, look, if we do go to East Block, you guys need to be clear on something. He said that whatever happened on death row stays on death row. It stays right here in this casa, right here in this house. It doesn't go nowhere else. You guys don't go somewhere else or you don't talk to somebody else about the politics that have taken place here on death row in the adjustment center in East Block. This is our casa and it stays here. Now, that's not something that you would normally tell you know, your people unless you, you were really worried about something coming out. That's just not something that you would say. It, it seems kind of out of character. I don't know. Maybe, maybe maybe, that's just his way of saying things. I don't know. But again, it was the general feeling that Ronnie was concerned about all the bad calls that had taken place. He knew that if they got moved to East Block, that all the Mexican Mafia members there would start to communicate and network with the rest of the organization. You know, the other, the other members that were in Pelican Bay, and, you know, once they got out, whether they were in High Desert, Salinas Valley, Ironwood, wherever they landed, that they would start communicating and that people would start talking. That's what people do. They start talking. 
So that's what they felt like. They felt like he was worried about that. But as far as Smokey personally, it was assumed that Smokey would expose what he knew about missing money, bad calls, and other issues. Smokey was perceived as being a direct threat to Ronnie's political career. That's what he was worried about. And he knew that Smokey knew about all these dirty little secrets. The best way to silence your potential threats is to eliminate them. So when it when it finally came time for everybody to move to East Block, when they came over and they were like, hey, all you guys are moving, pack it up. Here's bags for everybody. They came in with all the carts. You know, we're going to do this a little bit at a time. I'm not going to just do one big massive move. Ronnie was actually the first, the very first one to go to East Block, to get shot over there to East Block. He was the first one to be given bags, carts, pack your stuff, you're going to East Block. And coincidentally, Smokey just so happened to be the second one to move to East Block. So here's the main issue right here. The, the main issue that started the animosity between Ronnie and Smokey, it all started over a cat named Gabriel Castaneda, Gato from Puente, and how dudes like this were getting passes. The majority of the Sureños over there wanted to blast this guy behind the details of his case. <laughs> he raped, sodomized, and killed a nurse at a methadone clinic. Gato had apparently been programming with them for about 10 years, and nobody knew about the details of his case. I'm not sure how you miss something like that, but that's a that's a big foul. So they're having a conversation on the tier about novella, and Smokey says something to the effect of, "Man, I don't like the storylines in these novellas. They're all it's they're always showing some cat that's you know sexually abusing women. That basically they're 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 taking the pussy. That's that's excuse my French, but that's what that's what he said. He's like, man, you know, I don't like that shit. I don't like to to." You know, to watch shit like that, cats that are fucking, uh, you know, cats that are raping women, it's just some foul shit. So I'm sure when, when, when Smokey said that, there were probably, you know, a few sets of ears on that tier that probably perked up and thought that they were talking about them. So apparently when, when they're having this conversation, Gato, he hears the comment and he assumes that Smokey's talking about, he's talking about him and, his, and the, the details of his case. Truth be told, Smokey didn't know nothing about this guy's case. And if he did, he didn't know about those kind of details. So Gato, he's mad. He goes out to the next yard and he goes and he, he finds Ronnie and he complains to Ronnie. He's like, hey, man, he's like, check this out. You know, Friday night or whatever, you know, I'm on the tier. And, and next thing you know, I hear Smokey and such and such. They're having a conversation and they're talking about my case. They're throwing me on blast. You know, they're talking about the details of my case. So he, he goes and he cries to Ronnie about it. And Ronnie pulls Smokey aside and, and he gets on his helmet. He's like, hey, you know what the what are you guys doing? Why are you throwing this guy's business out there on the tier? Why are you guys talking about him? And Smokey's like, what are, what are you talking about? He's like, nobody, nobody was talking about him. I don't even, I don't even know nothing about his case. <laughs> what kind of case does he got anyway? So, anyways, that conversation right there, Ronnie tells him to kill it, whatever. Smokey says, you know, I, I ain't got nothing else to say to that dude. I'm not going to say nothing else to him, but I wasn't talking about him. But this ends up perking Smokey's interest. He gets curious, like, what is he worried about? So he goes to the law library. This completely caught him off guard. You know, he's like, let's see what this cat, you know, what kind of charges he, he's got. He's worried about something. So he goes to the law library. He pulls his case. He goes in there. He gets one of those, the, the legal books, because all death row cases are in the law books. And if they're not in the law books, you know, just, just the case, they're in the appeals. All of them, they go through they go through the appeal courts, the Ninth Circuits and all that. So he pulls one of those books. I think it's called California Reporter or something like that. He pulls one of those law books and he finds Gato's case and he's, he's floored by what he reads. He's like, you fucking gotta be kidding me. But he's like, man, fuck, I'm going to copy this shit. So he makes copies. He makes copies of the case and he gets back on the tier and he starts sending copies out. He's like, hey, check it out. Check <laughs> check out Gato's charges. So everybody starts reading about his charges. And when they put your, your, your case in those kind of law books, there's a spot in there that's called like factual background where they go into the nitty gritty, the details. So that's what that's what Smokey and everybody was reading. They're like, man, fuck, this is crazy. 
So they take this out to the yard and they tell Ronnie, they're like, hey, check it out. Check, check out this fool's case. When Smokey, when, when you know, he, he shows Ronnie, he's like, hey, man, he's like, let, let me take care of this. I'm ready to send this cat to Brazil, like right now. Let's handle this shit. You know, this dude's trash. But Ronnie tells him, no, we're not going to touch him. He got a pass by two brothers in the county jail. So we can't touch that. Just let it go. Smokey's confused. He's like, huh, what are, you, what are you talking about? He's like, man, this dude's, come on, bro. You, you know what I mean? Look at his charges. Ronnie was adamant about it. He's like, hey, he got a pass by two brothers in the county jail. He's like, we can't touch it. You know, we'll deal with it later, but we got to reach out to those two brothers and get at them about it first. So Ronnie assures him that they'll end up getting them later. But for right now, they got to they just got to let it go. So that was when the beginning of the disdain, it really started between Ronnie and Smokey. That's when it really started from that issue right there. From that point on, according to my source, every time Ronnie got a chance to take up a position against Smokey, he took it. Every chance he got at throwing a jab at Smokey, he did. Every chance he had an opportunity to throw Smokey in a negative light, he exploited it. You know, Ronnie didn't like the fact that a lot of the young Sureños gravitated towards Smokey. The influence he seen Smokey was having with these younger Sureños, with the youngsters, it was starting to bother him. And he took personal notice. He took, you know, he, he was seeing the influence play out in front of him out there on the yard. When, you know, you're a leader and there's somebody else that has leadership potential or they have those same, you know, characteristics. And, you know, there's somebody that allows their ego to get involved. If there's always, you know, the, 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 the manpower is always gravitating towards one individual, but they're not always gravitating towards the one that feels like they should be. Then, you know, the ego gets involved and it just starts to, to cause resentment. It starts to cause friction. And according to my source, that's what happened. Again, this is not coming from me. This is coming from my source. So let me make that very clear. So then there was another incident. That happened where a youngster came out to the yard one morning and out of nowhere acted like he had a wild hair up his butt. He got out of line and got real disrespectful with, with everybody out there on the yard. And, you know, Smokey and the rest of the yard wanted to get this guy, but Ronnie stopped it. Ronnie jumped in the middle and he stopped it. So, you know, he saved that youngster. But a couple of weeks later, that same youngster came back out to the yard and he j it off. He came out there. You know, he's probably one of those cats that had half his hair combed. But apparently, he tried to swing on Smokey. And when he tried to swing on Smokey, practically the whole yard, they just, they they stormed, they stormed swarmed on him. And this guy fell down. Ronnie, from my understanding, tried to, tried to break it up. But, you know, the whole yard swarmed on him, and they got him. So a few weeks later, that same youngster, he came back out to the yard and he j -catted. He j -catted out on everybody again the second time. You know, this is probably one of those kind of cats that had, you know, half his hair combed, probably had one eyebrow wearing dirty fucking boxers and, and a T-shirt that had coffee stains all over. But he came out to the yard and he started acting crazy. He started walking laps real fast and then came up to Smokey and then he tried to swing on him. When he tried to swing on Smokey, Ronnie again tried to stop it, but the whole yard, practically the whole yard swarmed on him. This cat fell down on the ground and he never got back up. They were stomping, the whole yard was stomping this cat out. So they packed this cat out, they take him off the yard, and according to my source, this was an embarrassing moment for Ronnie. Because this, this whole incident, it happened, you know, based on the fact that he was given a break the first time. They should have just stomped him out, got rid of him the first time. But since that didn't happen, he was allowed to come back out there and this second incident kicked off. So anyways, now when they get over there to East Block, Smokey should have been put on a group yard with everybody else. But because, you know, they took him off the Gallo, nobody was acknowledging him in East Block. You know, by then, everybody knew that there was something going on with Smokey, including the administration. Smokey goes to classification, and he's got like 15, 20, 10, 30s. You know, there's other people on the tier that know that he's obviously cut off, that, you know, he's excommunicated. So 
people started dropping kites. Hey, Fuviava is obviously in trouble with his people. They're not acknowledging him anymore. So instead of them putting him, Smokey, on a yard with the other active Sureños, they put him on a different yard, yard five, with, you know, Compton Cribs, with some 415ers, some Long Beach Cribs. You know, these guys were like, hey, Smokey could come out here and kick it with us. We ain't got no issue with Smokey. Yeah, let him come out here. So Smokey goes out there to yard five with those guys instead of yard two or three or yard one where everybody else was at. So here's somebody that's being shined on. Here's somebody that's being excommunicated. Smokey goes out to yard five. He goes out there and, you know, he continue, even though he's being shined on the way that, that he was, he still goes out there and continues, you know, to follow through with the obligations that he knows are is right what he's supposed to do. So my source told me that, you know, one day they're out there on the yard and all of a sudden the gunner starts shooting at five yards. Something kicks off on five yard. This yard is assigned to the Compton Cribs, the Bloods, the Bay Area Blacks, Asians, and the American Indians. So an American Indian by the name of Michael Martinez comes out. They call him Apache, who's there on death row for raping a 10 year old girl and for killing her mom. So this guy ends up coming out He's all bloody. He's got, he's got some big ass holes in him. He's got some ooey knots all over him. But he comes off the yard. He's he's bleeding profusely. He allegedly had been stabbed multiple times. So after they take Apache off the yard, they go and they get Smokey. They cuff Smokey up and they bring him off the yard. Others who had front row seats to the incident said it looked like Smokey was trying to kill this guy because Smokey was hitting this guy so hard with the knife that the handle had broke at one point. But, you know, the one thing that resonated with a lot of the Sureños from this incident right here on the yards one and two, those that still respected Smokey is that they seen that he was still active and sticking to the rules of the game. This demonstrated another level of hypocrisy and it clearly showed that not everyone was playing by the same rules. But here's another incident. Here's, here's another incident that kind of just made things even worse. But here's another incident that took place almost like three weeks later after Smokey allegedly stabbed Apache. So there was a young Sureño on yard two named Froggy from Riverside. Froggy gets out there to the yard and he basically refuses to respect the standing order to leave others alone out there that were convicted of crimes considered to be crimes of moral turpitude. I'll get into why this standing order was implemented, but first, let me tell you guys what happened. So after being out there with this guy by the name of Eric Bennett, who was there for rape and killing two women, Froggy decided that he didn't want to be out there with this kind of trash anymore. He was like, you know what? Fuck that. You know, I don't care. He pulls out his piece and he starts stabbing this guy, Eric Bennett. But two other Sorenos stop Froggy and pull him aside. They step in and basically scold him for what he did. Meanwhile, the gunner missed the whole incident. So this guy, Bennett, doesn't say nothing. He washes the blood off his clothes, cleans up, and acts like nothing happened. But then he goes back in the building and he gets it. So when Ronnie found out what happened, what do you think What do you think he did? My source said, you think he, he told you know, his people to go out there and stab this individual since he became aware of the charges? You think he told them to go out there and get rid of this dude? Instead, he orders Swifty from Asusa and Midget from Colton to go out there and hit Froggy. So that's what they do. And they almost kill him for honoring the obligations that he's been taught as an active Sureño. This goes down as another example of the mono treatment. So the justification for not going after these guys with foul charges is being attributed to the agreement to end hostilities. The justification is that the verbiage or interpretation of this agreement stipulates that there will be no more going after different groups or different ethnicities and that each ethnicity will take care of its own. In other words, the justification for not going after the undesirables is based off of the agreement to end hostilities. My source said that this is just a poor excuse to justify staying out there where all the drugs are at and to simply skirt their obligations. Furthermore, let's just say for argument's sake that this was true, even though we all know it isn't. He said, well, then what happens when people refuse to take out their own trash? Do you allow their trash to coexist or do you take your own steps to remove the problem? The jury still seems to be out on that one. Not only that, but 
This is another example of the hypocrisy being applied to death row politics. My source said they're making their own rules because that's not how this agreement to end hostility is applied on level four yards. So meanwhile, the last issue I'm gonna get into before I wrap up this part of this story, there was one other issue that added a little bit more fuel to the fire. And this is when several Mexican mafia members were called back to the county from Pelican Bay. They were called to come down to testify as character witnesses. Lalo from Lomas apparently called a bunch of Mexican mafia members to come down and to testify in his case. And this is this is a you know an old tactic that used to be applied all the time. You know, when people were pro per and they had the ability to utilize different type of court resources, they would try to bring down a bunch of people from Pelican Bay or Corcoran, a bunch of Mexican mafia members, a bunch of NF members, a bunch of AB members, whoever they were going to bring down. They would call all these guys down to the county and the whole purpose wouldn't, wouldn't be to really testify in the case. It would be to either handle some business. Sometimes they would call a target down there or a lot of the times it was just to have everybody come down and to be able to just talk about business, organization business. The NF does it, the Aryan Brotherhood does it, the Mexican Mafia does it, the BGF does it. So Lalo calls all these guys down to the county jail. So while all this was going on, another MN member called Smokey down there and it just so happened that all this went down at the same time. While all these guys came down from Pelican Bay, Smokey was being pulled from San Quentin off a of death row. But when Smokey got down there, the sheriff went to the judge and told the judge that they didn't want Smokey housed in that jail because of his case. Smokey was on death row for killing the sheriff. So they end up housing Smokey in Lancaster on an EOP yard to keep him isolated and away from everyone else. All the other Mexican mafia members that came down from Pelican Bay, they were all housed in Lancaster as well but they put them all in another unit. They put them in another housing unit and they kept them separated away from Smokey. But here's the thing. My source said that when they brought Smokey back from court, Ronnie was all paranoid. He tells Smokey, how come they didn't call me or Hector down there? Ronnie apparently assumed that they called Smokey down there to ask him questions about what was going on on death row. Ronnie also seemed to be envious over the fact that they called Smokey instead of him, as if Smokey was starting to have more influence than them. But this was all in Ronnie's head, and his resentment towards Smokey was only growing deeper. But there's still one more issue that kind of contributed to this. There used to be another Mexican Mafia member by the name of David Fierro, D, from Fontana. I was actually there with him back in the mid-90s before he got his death penalty case turned over. Well, D apparently came back from court one day with a huge chunk of black. When he got there, he landed on the tier with Smokey and gave Smokey the chunk of black. Smokey tells D to cut it up and to give a little bit to all the camaradas on his tier. D breaks everyone off a little bit, but he saves the majority for Ronnie. When Ronnie finds out that he didn't get all of it, he goes ballistic. He gets mad at Smokey for telling D to give a little bit to all the other camaradas on the tier with him. He's mad because he didn't get all of it. Bottom line, he was upset that you know, it didn't go directly to him and that it went to Smokey. That's that's what the issue really was about. It was the fact that, you know, that's Ronnie's house and it should have went directly to Ronnie and Ronnie should have got it in its entirety. The whole thing. That's what Ronnie was. That's what he was upset about. And I can understand that to, to a degree. Smokey apparently didn't know nothing about black. He never fucked with black. But, you know, as somebody that used to fuck with it, I can imagine how Ronnie felt about it. You know, when you're somebody that indulges in something like that, no doubt about it. You want all that shit. Give me all that shit. So this is going to conclude this part of the story. There's going to be a part three that's going to go into a little bit more of, you know, some of the issues about death row politics. But this right here, this pretty much sums up, you know, what the what the disagreement was with regards to Freddie Tubiava. So there's obviously going to be a part three to this story right here. And, you know, I'm going to touch up on a little bit more of the, the hypocrisy regarding death row politics. But right here, as far as, you know, the, the, the disagreement between 
Ronnie and Freddie Fuyava, Smokey from Linwood. This pretty much sums that part of it up. So, anyways, I hope you guys enjoyed this this story right here. I know it's a little different, but you know, again, this is coming from cats that are on death row that are no longer active. They want to put their truth out there, what they went through and why they don't agree with some of the things that are going on on death row, the politics of it. You know, and this again, this is not directed at anybody in particular. This is death row across the board. You have NF members that are out there on yard three. You got Wevel, James Trujillo that's out there with five other Northaniels that are on yard three. You know, you got other cats on on the five yards so this isn't just directed at one organization or one group these politics are being pushed on death row across the board with everybody so these are different politics from what you see out there on level four yards this wouldn't be allowed to happen out there on level four yards i'm sure you guys would agree with that but you guys you guys give me your opinions what do you guys think about you know, everything that 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 was pointed out in this story right here, everything that you know my sources you know put out there. What do you guys think about it? Anyways, I hope you guys enjoyed this story. I got another one coming out for you guys tomorrow. Again, for those of you that have been asking about inner demons, I'm gonna try to get on one tomorrow. Anyways, with that being said, I hope you guys are ready for Halloween. Be safe out there. You know, shit gets crazy. Anyways. I'll be back hopefully again tomorrow night. It's your boy B and I'm out.